hello everybody and welcome back good to be with you guys again and this is part four of our patch knife making video on this episode we're gonna go ahead and cover the final fit and finish of the blade itself to the handle uh, get, it, get everything all cleaned up and nice we're gonna show you how to in properly install the rivets and then I'll show you how to add a little uh, embellishment a little decoration on this particular knife and also how I go about antiquing and sharpening it so all going to be covered in this episode what I have done here off camera if you'll notice the uh, the cutting edge of the blade it almost looks like it's been sharpened it hasn't quite been sharpened yet but I did take my uh, small harbor freight belt sander and with a 220 grit belt on there I did refine that cutting edge down to just just shy of sharp but you couldn't cut yourself on it but it's close that just uh, makes it easy to put the final edge on it when it's time but um, first thing I'm gonna do is go ahead and hand sand this blade out to the final finish I want on it. you have to decide how fine a finish you want on it again colonial era knives didn't have a hugely uh, fine and refined finish on them usually draw filing was about it um, what I'm gonna do on this blade is take it to about uh, 150 grit and stop there that's uh, it's it's a little finer than a file could put on it but not much and uh, that also makes it uh, antique fairly well keeps the metal pores of the steel open you put a real real fine you know high gloss finish on it if you're gonna antique it it makes it hard for whatever you're using to permeate the top layer of the steel so about 150 grits is fine as I'm gonna go on this blade so I'll get set up for that and show you how I go about putting the uh, sanded finish on the blade okay so what I've got here is a scrap piece of wood mounted in the vise it can be whatever width and length you need to accommodate the blade size you're working on so the blade sitting on there and then I'll take a C clamp whatever size again that you need put a little piece of leather at the back of the knife that helps keep it from sliding around get the cutting edge up close to the edge of the board there and tighten it down so it won't move around and then hand sanding I just take a a file again whatever size you you want you want to back your sandpaper and then just roll it around it like so whatever configuration you need but with that back uh, you can generate a lot of force and do the most uh, amount of work as far as finishing the blade so hand sanding uh, pretty much just goes like this and I'll go ahead and demonstrate it for you alright so it's been about 10 minutes of sanding on this side with the 100 grit I'm uh, pretty happy with how it looks now I got rid of most of the file marks on it I did leave some forge indentation back in here just for a little character on this knife but uh, it's, I'm gonna go ahead now and flip it over and repeat that process on the other side okay so at this point I've got everything leveled out and smoothed up about the way I want it um, after the 100 grit on both sides I went to 150 grit and repeated that process on both sides I should also note that I flipped the knife over with the cutting edge down and the spine facing up in the vise I swapped this out for padded jaws and sanded the spine of the knife as well taking it down to the 150 and then also this recessed area of the tang too you want to get all your tool marks out because as you fit it to the handle becomes much more difficult to file and sand so you want to get it pretty close to where you want to be at this stage so we're going to set the blade aside now that it's pretty close and ready to be mounted in the handle and switch over to the handle our section of white tail deer antler needs a little bit more refining to where I'm happy with it and again most things on knives they taper in other words they're heavier at the base and they tapered forward as you go uh, toward the knife cutting tip um, both the sides and the ends so 
it's also very important with antler if you're going to antique it to get uh, any modern tool marks out of it such as um, if you've worked it over with any kind of a belt sander or whatnot because if you antique it that will stick out like a sore thumb it looks incorrect on a period knife so you want to be really careful at this stage to work the antler over um, both with a file and then sandpaper to get out any modern tool marks and on antler I'll take it down a little finer I'll go to 220 grit on it again start with a file go to 100 go to 150 and then 220 but I just want to smooth everything out um, get a nice radius on the cross section here round out these sharp corners and also the crown section it's uh, got a nice round feature that I want to smooth out and level with the file and the sandpaper so I'll show you that demonstrate that here just a little while and then we'll pause and finish it out and show you the next step get around here and this is just a uh, a padded section of wood that I've covered with leather it has a little stop here if you need it you can use it for all kinds of different stuff or it just makes a nice convenient work height to set something down and file away so just uh, take your time work things over pretty much just like this smoothing and leveling getting rid of all those modern tool marks then also it's helpful to occasionally stop and hold it in your hand this knife's pretty small this handle it's only about four inches and just see if there's anything uncomfortable in it because what you're feeling is if you're trying to sell it also what a customer is going to feel so if there's any sharp spots or something that's not feeling comfortable go ahead and address that at this point so just continue on like this till we're happy with it and then once we're happy with uh, everything that we filed out switch over to the sandpaper and take it through the various grids alright so at this point I've got everything pretty much the way I want it to be I've got the antler all filed down sanded down contoured nice the blade is pretty much its final uh, finish on that one area you want to be real careful to get finished is this round transition where the handle meets the blade because after we install the blade that's really hard to get sanded so if you've got any marks sander marks or whatever up in this area you want to ha go ahead and get those taken care of and pretty much get it where it needs to be for its final fit and finish I've sanded down the antler uh, everywhere I wanted it with 220 contoured everything nice same uh, idea with the butt end we got that all taken care of and smoothed down so now it's time to talk about uh, setting our rivets and again as we mentioned in the previous video you want to make sure that your pinhole fit or rivet hole fit has a little resistance if they're real loose and sloppy and you got play in the blade that's going to translate into the finished knife and you'll have play in the finished knife which is bad for a number of reasons but also you don't want the holes to be too tight if um, they're so tight you're having to drive them in for all it's worth with a hammer uh, they're probably not going to fit right and you may even bust your handle so as I said in the previous video if your holes are too tight that's an easy fix with a round needle file just enlarge them a little bit using the um, drill and the file chucked in the drill ran backward you can gently enlarge both uh, the handle material and the blade tang if the hole is too loose you can take the knife out and gently peen on the tang around the hole with a ball peen hammer not the handle but the tang and those will shrink up and you want a fit that has some resistance in it but not that much because you want it to easily be able to go through the hole one other thing that you want to do let me get around here is take a countersink and just gently you can do this by hand countersink and dish out each one of these holes to give that rivet material somewhere to go on these 18th century style of knives um, they're not finished to a high degree in other words filled completely out in this recess that I'm making and then filed off you can if you want to but oftentimes they would protrude with a nice dome effect and have the hand hammered finish on it which not only looks sharp but is secure as well so just by hand gently make a little recess in order for some of that excess rivet 
to uh, have somewhere to go. Okay. You might have to go back and forth, uh, pivoting side to side to make up for the contour and the hand on to get an even removal all the way around. Alright, so that looks good. Let me uh, get one of the pins now. And again, this is uh, a number, well, I can't remember what the number is, I have to look at the box, but a finishing nail. And what I do is go ahead and cut the end of the nail head off, which I've done on this first one, so I'll show you how to turn it into a rivet nail. Okay, so we'll take it and chuck it up in the vise. You can get special jaw pads that actually make this chore a lot easier. That They're tapered and they hold the rivet head, but this does work. Um, and tighten it up. You want to leave about a quarter inch sticking up out of the vise. And then just take a any kind of file and smooth that cut of the uh, end of the rivet up so it's nice and flat. And get rid of any burrs that are sticking out. Okay, now with the ball portion of a ball peen hammer, just gently go around the head of it and widen it out so that you've got a nice rivet form. It takes a little practice to get good at it, but this is the way it was traditionally done. And then you can kind of smooth it out with the hammer portion. You don't have to get carried away with it and form a great big giant head, unless that's what the design you're going for, but you just want enough to go into that recess that we augured out on the handle. It's in there tighter than I thought. Okay, so with that in place, go ahead and put it through our first hole. You can see it's going in with a little resistance, but not too much. So we've got uh, one out of three done. And I'm going to go ahead and cut the other side of this off with a pair of nippers. Now one thing on riveting, and this is the case for uh, handle material fastening, or if it's a through tang, you see this a lot, and it's a common mistake of leaving way too much rivet material sticking out and attempting to peen it down flush. Um, if you've ever seen various TV shows where they're struggling to get the end peen tight, they're using a torch. You should not have to use a torch. You can, and historically sometimes the end was heated up. But you really only want to leave out on the rivet, the opposite side that I'm going to cut, about a double layer thickness of paper, maybe just a little more. You know, uh, an eighth of an inch or quarter of an inch that's way too much metal to try and hammer flush to get it to sink up tight and uh, you'll just have a lot of problems it won't it won't uh, squeeze that tight if you have a lot of excess metal the metal will start bending and breaking and it's a lot of trouble can happen for that so you really don't want that much sticking out of here when you go to peen this up tight so I'm gonna go ahead and cut this off And that's even a little bit too much. You might have to take on a sander or a grinder to get it down just a little more. So I'm going to go ahead and thin this one down just a little more, show you what I've got, and then we'll repeat that for these other three. Alright, so I've gone ahead and got the rivets cut off. I don't know if you can see that or not, but they're just barely sticking out of the other side. I removed the excess with a grinder. Um, and if you're into measurements, it's less than a sixteenth of an inch in most cases it needs to stick out of the other side. And especially important if you're doing, again, a through tang knife where you've got the tang, or uh, excuse me, the tang exposed and you're trying to hammer that down. Tool steel is only going to move just so far. In this case, these are low carbon steel, closer to iron, but with the tang of a knife, it's tool steel. That's only going to move just so far before you start having a lot of problems of it either cracking apart, um, maybe wanting to bend in the wrong direction. So you need to keep that uh, amount fairly small. You don't need a whole lot to be strong, just a little bit. And what this is commonly accomplished with 
I also might add you might want to cover your blade at this point if you've got it close to being finished it needs antiqued usually I will cover it right now I don't but something to keep in mind um, I'm gonna use a ball peen hammer I've got a couple of them here and the ball portion is what we use to uh, squish these rivets out you can use a cross peen hammer which some prefer because it's uh, a little more forceful you can get the material to move a little faster but I like the ball peen the ball portion because it's easy on the handle material it's nigh on to impossible to hit the rivet head every single time you will probably slip one way or the other and this will minimize the effects that you'll have on your handle material so I've got a small one here and then a little bit larger one to spread material with this is an antique one it has a very round ball on it that's nice for smoothing the rivets out and also if you want to, I'm not demonstrating it on this one, but if you want to epoxy your blade in there, maybe you've done everything you possibly can do and there's still a little play in it, now is the time. This one came out pretty tight and uh, any gaps are pretty minimal along where the handle meets the tang, so I'm not going to use epoxy, but epoxy would be obviously at this stage and then put your rivets in. And again, if you're working with glue, it's important to make sure that your pins uh, go through with just a little bit of resistance so that you're not have to fight with that uh, epoxy setting up. So I'll go ahead and get the ball peen hammer and show you how I do this process. You just start real easy. Start squishing them down. You might want to use the hammer portion if you're needing to smooth it out. Switch over to the big one here. And you want to stop hammering just when everything shrinks up and gets tight. If you overdo it, um, you're going to risk cracking your handle material. So just snugged up tight and then you want to stop. So uh, do one side, flip it over, do some on the other, and then you can look at it on top and see if you've got any sticking out. I like to try and get my rivets set to where my finger is not catching on either side so we'll just continue doing that on the reverse side flip it over and you want to make sure I'm using the uh, flat part of the anvil here you want to make sure that you get the reverse side of the rivet firmly set on here because if there's any kind of a gap and the force is being transferred into your handle again you risk cracking it so go slow make sure you're happy with it before you hit it flip it over no more. okay this first one here I've started with the back it's looking pretty good so I'm gonna go ahead and advance to the second two and pretty much use the same procedure there and just pay attention to uh, you know make sure the rivet head is filling in everywhere you want to you don't want to see any voids around your rivet that looks kinda of sloppy so again take your time be careful um, just tighten them up till everything's snug and stop you don't want to overdo it okay so our riveting is all done everything come out pretty good hopefully it did for you too if you're trying this at home I've got them uh, all fitting nice now nothing's wanting to catch on my finger um, any kind of little gap in here is pretty much gone it's snugged up and we're ready now for a little bit of embellishment on the handle and what I'm gonna put on the handle um, sometimes 18th century knives had this you might think of it as checkering but it's really not because it's much more crude than that it's cross hatching in other words a series of X spots filed into the handle um, some people have said to give it a little bit of texture and I suppose it does to a degree but mostly it just looks uh, kind of dresses the knife up a little bit and I don't really have a method per se to lay those out it's uh, pretty much just done by eye and what I will use though is a piece of cardstock and I'll lay it across the knife handle uh, where I approximately want it folded around and trace the line on with a pencil and the nice thing about that is if say eh, well I don't really like the way that's lining up or looking just take a little piece of uh, 
cloth with some rubbing alcohol on it, wipe it off, and it'll get rid of your line and you can redo it. So I'm going to go ahead and get these laid out using that uh, procedure and show you how I put those on. Okay, so I've got the first section of uh, checkering, or more correctly, cross hatching, because this is way more cruder laid out. You can see it there faintly on the handle. And again, uh, just take your time. Be sure you're happy with the layout. You like the way it looks. Um, the tricky part is you want to try and repeat it on the reverse side, which can get it to line up as nice if you can on both sides. That takes a little work to get that to come out, but it can be done. So to begin, um, to get that on there, what I'm going to do is tighten it up in the or, uh, piece of scrap wood again with a C-clamp and leather pads to protect the blade and then take a triangular file that works good for this and you want to make sure it's fairly sharp if you have a real dull one that's wore out it's going to tend to want to skate on the uh, handle material let me cock our camera up here just a little bit and uh, cause a lot of trouble so you want to have good lighting when you do this also if you need to move in order for it to be comfortable and get uh, done what you're trying to accomplish don't be afraid to move all over the place if you need to adjustable light is nice if you need it so I just start near where the end meets the tang and just slowly work the file in. don't get in a hurry let the file do its job before you start advancing it cutting a groove and just do your best to stay on your line and work it all the way around. And once I get it established, like that one is now, then it's a little easier to go back over it and deepen it a hair if you want to for a little more of a bold look to it. So that's one down on that and four to go before we lay the next set out. Alright, so we've gone ahead and taken care of our check ring. You can't really see it at this point because the handle is still very light in color, but uh, it is on there. And what I'm going to do next is antique the blade. Now, when it comes to 18th century accoutrements of any type, nowadays it's very, very popular to age or antique the, uh, these items to give them a, a weathered appearance. Now there's two schools of thought on this. One being that originally the argument's been made they would have never ever antiqued something because if they did, something that they made in 1750 would look like it came from 1650 and that really wouldn't make much sense back in the day. And there is merit to that argument. But today they also there's the argument that we don't use this stuff like they did originally. You know, a knife like this would go to work and be used heavily probably every single day until it was completely wore out after you know a long period of time so the patina would come much faster I tend to fall somewhere in between that argument I do like to age things but not heavily you know some people and if you know you're into that that's fine will antique something to a degree that it looks very very old and used I like to put just what's been referred to as a gentle warm patina on everything so the first time or first portion of this knife that we're going to antique is the blade now the blade itself I have uh, gently hand sanded this several times with 150 grit and wiped off in between the uh, the sandings with rubbing alcohol you want don't want to you want to make sure there's no oil or fingerprints or residue on your blade or this can affect it and what I'm going to use what I've got in this small container here is a little bit of acid called ferric chloride. Ferric chloride is just one of a great many different ones that are available. It's one of many that I use to age knife blades, gun mounts, sword parts. It's one that I'm fond of on carbon steels because it's quick. It doesn't work on the lower carbon stuff like these uh, mostly iron rivets. It won't really have any effect on there but it has a reaction with the carbon that is in high carbon tool steels and will give us a nice aged appearance on this knife so after you've got your blade sanded down like I said several times and wiped off with alcohol or acetone to degrease it what I do then 
just take just a propane torch and we're just going to pass it over this lightly a couple of times to warm it up and open the pores on the metal and it will accept the uh, acid much more readily then. So. And that should do it just to warm it up a little bit. And several things I have on hand here. I've got uh, eye protection on which you always want to have when dealing with acid. I've got the window behind me open for good ventilation. I like to use when putting this stuff on a small sponge. You want to put it on nice and even. Uh, a lot of times you'll see people completely submerge it down in which you can do. Um, it's not always an option because you don't want to get acid on your handle material. And also, I'm doing the blade first, the handle second, because this acid can affect the type of solution I use to antique the handle. So, uh, blade first. But anyway, we use a small sponge, and also you want to make sure you have clean water and baking soda on hand to neutralize this acid. So to begin, and you don't really want to touch this stuff. It'd be a good idea to wear gloves, but I'm going to risk it. Live on the edge here today and just stick it on there and quickly go from bottom to top so you don't leave any streaks. So in other words if I was to hit it right there and just stop we'd have a darker spot there. So you can see that's already turning a nice dark color. Do the spine, flip it over, go on this side. Don't be afraid to dip it back in there if you need more, if it's drying out going to gently go along the spine. We can wipe that off of the antler, which is why I do the blade first. Sometimes I'll do the blade even before I permanently affix it to the handle. Um, for instance, with swords and things of that nature, sometimes if you've got an elaborate guard or uh, whatnot, it would hard be hard to get around. It's easier to do the blade and then take and uh, cover it with paper and masking tape to protect it but so it just depends on what you're uh, trying to do here we're going to do it after it's already been affixed in the handle so you just wipe it on there and let it work for a while it tends to look kind of yellow and nasty right now but it mellows out to just a nice gray light gray with streaks of dark in it so it gives it a just a gentle patina kind of uh, a look of maybe it's been used for a year or two but not abused which is kind of the look I like to put on my stuff see it's starting to dry which is fine and I'll typically leave this on here for several minutes again the longer you leave it the more it's gonna do but I don't like to overdo it so once you get it where you want it then you can gently rinse it off with clean water and go over it with some water and baking soda and it will neutralize the solution that's on here. So I'm going to let this sit for just a couple more minutes and then go ahead and wash it off and neutralize it. Alright, so at this stage the blade is now antiqued. I've taken some steel wool now that it's dry and gently buffed it off just to level things out a little bit. And it looks a little light on camera but it has a nice uh, light gray color with some dark streaking which is that's that's what I like to put on a blade that looks good. The next step that I do is I will go ahead and seal this with a mixture, this nasty mixture down here of beeswax and turpentine. You take, uh, fill whatever kind of metal container you have up about a third with turpentine and then beeswax, thin shavely into it. You can use a block plane or a knife and then meld it together to where it's like a paste. If it's so hard you can't have a little stick in there agitated around with ease it's you've got too much beeswax in it or if it's too much of a liquid too much turpentine so find the right blend I don't really have a recipe I just do it by eye but this makes a real nice sealer on the blade it levels it out even just a little bit more and gives a little bit of protective coating so to do that go back to our trusty propane torch 
just heat, gently heat this up a little bit, not uh, extreme heat or anything. That just opens the pores on the metal. Anytime you heat metal up, it's just like your skin. When you get it hot from a shower or what have you, it will open the pores up. Then I just take a little bit of this mixture and with a stick, and you can tell if you got your blade up to temperature, it'll liquefy pretty quickly. You want to be careful not to get too much of this on your uh, handle material because that will keep the antiquing that we're going to do next on there from penetrating the antler. I also should add that if you're going to antique your knife blade before the handle and your handle is made of wood, you need to do it in reverse. You need to get your handle uh, finished first because uh, if any of the acid gets on the raw wood it can discolor it. So after I put that on there then I'll just take a rag and buff off the excess. And you can set it aside for a couple minutes just to dry because if it's uh, the blade is still hot it will stay in somewhat of a liquid form on there. Alright, so I'm going to set up to antique this knife handle, which I'll go into detail here in just a second. But to set up for it, again, I've got our checkering on there. You can't, yeah, you can see it a little bit on both sides. So I'll gently sand everything on this knife, the handle that is, and wipe it down with alcohol again. You don't want wax or oil on there, or the antiquing solution won't be able to get in there and work. So I'll go ahead and get everything prepped on this handle, wiped off with alcohol, and get set up for the next step. Okay, so setting up to antique antler or bone, and as with all these things that we're doing, there's many, many different ways to go about aging bone and antler that have been done down through the years. I use all different kind of methods depending on what I'm going for. Um, but what I've been using lately is potassium permanate, which I may be butchering that pronunciation, so forgive me if I am. And it's a, a chemical. It's been around for quite a long time. It actually existed in a crude form in the 18th century. You can't really see it, but I have just a little, uh, eh, it's probably about a six ounce, no, it's four ounces, four ounce bottle of this stuff. It just looks like a gray powder. I bought this from Dawn Scientific. They're online. You can get it many, many different places. But uh, just a little tiny shot of this in water mixed up will give you a liquid that does a phenomenal job to age uh, bone and antler. And one nice thing about it is a little bit goes a long, long way. Let me get the container that I've mixed up here. This is enough to do many, many handles. I just did it by eye here this morning. There's probably only less than a teaspoon in there, maybe a tablespoon and a half of water, and it's given us this uh, quite a bit of solution here to work with. Now you see that and you you tend to think uh, we're going to put a purple solution on our knife. Boy, that's uh, it's going to look great, Ben. But uh, it has a chemical reaction with uh, the contents of antler and bone and it will start not long after you put it on there to turn it a nice aged patina color and the weaker you mix it of course the weaker it will be on your um, chosen material so you want to experiment have a scrap piece left over that you can test on and uh, be sure you're going to be happy with the color you're getting from the mixture that you've made so just like when we antique the blade we want to open the pores up on this antler. Antler and bone, cow horn, the dye will take much better if we preheat it. So I'm going to use a heat gun to do this. This is just a cheap one that I picked up from Harbor Freight. You don't want to overdo it but just heat it up enough to where it be a little uncomfortable to the touch of the hand. And I have it on the low setting. That should do it to get it preheated. 
You can put it on a lot of different ways. I just take a little stick and tape a piece of rag on the end of it. That works okay. So mix it up a little bit here. And then in fairly long even strokes just start top to bottom painting it on there. And again it's as it dries it will start antiquing so when you see this nasty purplish color on there don't freak out it'll turn the color we're looking for here in just a minute and you can wipe up the access as you're going if you want sometimes it's easier to just dip the crown section down in it if you have a enough solution mix to get in all the little nooks and crannies and you can put multiple coats on this if it's uh, a little lighter than you want it to be you can go over it again okay so I've got that all painted on there now I'm just gonna take a cloth and wipe up some of the excess here you can already see it's starting to antique it purples fading away and the antique colors coming on which is good alright so what I'm gonna do now is take the heat gun again run it over it and dry it just a little bit mellow the colors out and see what we got alright so it doesn't look too bad it's a little light for what I was going for so I think I'm gonna hit it one more time okay so I put the second coat on it and it got it knocked down a little bit to the color I was looking for and after you finish doing that you'll notice the uh, sheen on it will be very very dull almost a matte which kinda looks fake to be honest so uh, you really don't want that you want there to be a bit of a sheen on it because originally as your hand would grip the knife it would go in and out of a knife sheath and just uh, go through general purpose use this antler uh, for gonna match patina would have a shine to it because all those things create wear so all you need to do is take a piece of fine 4 aught steel wool and gently just go over all the surfaces of the knife you don't want to overdo it and really vigorously scrub it because you can start removing uh, the antiquing that we put on there so that's counterproductive but just gently go over it and you'll start to see a gentle shine develop on it and when you've got the surface to your liking then you want to go ahead and halt that process so this knife is just about complete the only other thing that we're gonna do is of course put an edge on it I'll be making a sheath for it but that'd be a separate video at some point so I'll show you how I sharpen it and then uh, we'll call this project done okay so we've gone about creating our little uh, patch knife and as with any knife it's only as good as it is sharp so it's time to put an edge on it uh, my process for this is to use a quick method a lot of times you'll see uh, people using various wet stones that you know that's been done for hundreds of years and that's fine it does work I've done it that way before but it is extremely slow and again since I do this for a living sometimes when I'm coming out here to sharpen a batch of knives I've got six or ten knives to do and uh, you need something a little more efficient that will do a good job but do it in a quick fashion so the answer to that is my trusty little 1x32 Harbor Freight belt sander and uh, this sharpens a knife very very well very fast uh, what you need to do if you're going to do this method is get knife sharpening or tool sharpening uh, belts for it you can find them uh, from a multitude of places online and the main difference is 
you can get them in really fine grits. You know, you can get them, if I'm starting and a knife has a fairly heavy blunt edge on it, I'll start with usually a 220 and then work my way all the way up to like an 800 grit before I'll call it good. But uh, again, it's a very fast, uh, efficient way of doing it. It does take practice. There are jigs you can buy that hold them at the approximate angles. I just do it uh, freehand, but it's going to be at an approximate 25 degree angle is what we're shooting for. And with sharpening a knife for many, many years, I struggled, you know, trying to get that razor killer edge on a knife. And there's just a few simple principles you need to keep in mind, and you can get a good edge on a knife. And uh, the first thing is you have to hold it at a consistent angle. You know, if you're constantly changing angles, well, that's going to be transferred to the knife you're trying to sharpen, and consequently, it's going to be wonky. You're never going to get uh, the metal work down evenly. Second, you have to sharpen it to the point to where, uh, let me grab the little knife here, to where a wire edge will appear. And what that is, it's nothing more than the metal getting thinned down to the point to where it gently is rolling over the other side. In other words, it's so thin it can't support itself and you'll feel a little burr that your fingernail will actually catch. And you want to take the metal off evenly. So if I make a couple of passes on one side, uh, a couple more on the other side, but when you're getting close, that wire edge will form, or burr as it's called, no matter what method you're using. If you don't get that, then chances are your edge, even though it may look like it, is still relatively blunt and you're not going to have that sharp killer edge on it that everybody's looking for. Now, when that forms, you're not done yet. You have to strop the knife and that is going to remove that bird. A lot of people know the basic of sharpening a knife, but they fall short when it comes to the stropping and that's very important because if you're to take your fingernail and run it on the cutting edge after you've sharpened it, it should feel like a piece of glass. Silky smooth, nothing catching, and if you don't strop it, you're not going to get that. It'll be extremely jagged, uh, you'll feel your nail catching on it, and consequently, that is the feel you're going to get when you're cutting something. It's not to its full potential, so to strop it, and you know, you've all seen a, a barber with a strop going back and forth on a leather strop. Uh, that's what you have to do. You can use a leather belt, scrap piece of leather, or I have actually a grinding wheel with a, a small leather belt on it that turns very, very slowly that I'll use, I'll show you. But um, that's the method that I use. And again, it takes practice to do freehand. If you want to do it, I would recommend going to like a... Uh, a dollar store or a thrift store there's always cheap kitchen knives for sale there used ones at like a thrift shop you can get for 50 cents buy a few of them bring them home and just practice and you can take a piece of junk and put a razor sharp edge on it when you feel confident enough that you're being consistent and then you can switch over to something that you've taken t some time with and handmade and start sharpening them that way so again it doesn't take very long i'll show you how i do it and then uh We'll pronounce this knife complete. Alright, in just that short amount of time, I've taken this knife that was not sharp and put a pretty darn sharp edge on it. Now, one thing I'm going to do, I'm not going to film it, is switch belts to a very fine belt and just polish this edge a little bit and then strop it, but literally that was all it took to get this knife pretty darn close to a finished edge. So, hold on just a second and I'll show you the next step.
Okay, so I just hit that a couple times on the next finer belt, which I think was around a 600 grit belt, and it just took literally like uh, a minute like the other one did. It will take a little longer, obviously, if you have a larger knife or if uh, your rough edge is heavier than this one was. But again, it's a pretty darn quick, efficient method that I typically use on a knife. So I've got that burr on the cutting edge of this blade like I talked about. Now to get rid of it we have to strop it. What I use is this other machine that I have called a Tormek sharpener. Uh, it's got a sharpening stone on one side. It's, it's handful, handy for sharpening chisels and things. But what I mainly use is this leather stropping wheel. And it's going to do the same thing as a scrap piece of leather or a uh, barber strop. In other words, you know, the back and forth except it turns in a circular fashion and it's a lot faster and more efficient. has a little motor, runs real slow at 90 RPM and that's what I use to take that wire edge off. So I'll show you that real quick. Alright, let's wipe this off. I have a little bit of oil on there to help lubricate it. And again, we just want to take our fingernail and ride it on the cutting edge. Feels pretty good. I got a little burr right here in the middle that I'm still feeling, so I'll go ahead and polish it just a second. Okay, that feels pretty good. My fingernail's not catching anywhere nice and smooth and uh, we call that fully sharpened now so I'll show you a fun little test that you can do to ensure that you got a good edge on your knife and then this is uh, ready to have a sheath made and go to work all right so one fun little test to do with the sharpened blade is of course the paper cutting test and if it's nice and sharp where it should be, it should glide right through it. This is just uh, copier paper. So we'll give it a little test and see what we got. I believe that passes the muster. Nice and sharp. That'll shave hair right off your arm. I should also mention that when polishing or stropping the edge on a... Uh, machine like this you need to be very careful I've had this happen before because if you get your angle wrong and that catches it it will throw it back and throw it back into you and with the blade being razor sharp now you'll end up with a nice cut so be very cautious when doing that it's not press too hard or hold it at such an angle where the machine grabs it but this blade is uh, pretty much finished and ready for sheath so I'll lay it on the table so hopefully you can get a good look at it and then uh, We'll call this one done and ready to go. So here we have our nice little finished patch knife blade. It came out pretty good. Happy with it. Colors look good and everything on it. It's got a nice sharp edge. It's ready to go to work. One thing that you can do if you'll notice the rivets still have a bit of a shine to them. Um, you can take a little bit of liquid gun browning which I'm going to go into detail in another video about how to use various things to antique and touch a little dab of that stuff on the heads of these rivets and that will darken and age those up. You kind of got to be careful because if you get too much or it bleeds over onto your handle it can remove the antiquing so you got to be real careful when you do that. But uh, everything come out really good. Happy with it. It's nice and sharp. It's comfortable. Uh, this has about a four inch handle and then about a four and a half inch blade on it. So it's a real nice size for a patch knife or neck knife. Uh, they didn't always just use these to cut patches by the way. That's just kind of a name we attach to them. And oftentimes this was just a good serviceable small belt knife or neck knife or shooting pouch knife that they would affix and take into the woods and with all the other items that you had with you it would uh, fit the bill for an afternoon squirrel hunt or small camp knife whatever you needed it to be. A little knife like this works works really well for that. So we appreciate everybody tuning in on this one. It was a fun project to do with y'all. And I look forward to doing more projects with y'all down the road. 
Again, if you're new to our channel, thank you for tuning in, and I'd like to invite you to subscribe. That way you'll get the notifications when the new videos come up. So until next time, thanks so much, everybody, and take care.